OK, hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, this is a talk um, as part of the Centre for Gender Studies. Um, so I'm Laura Clancy. I'm the director of the Centre for Gender Studies at Lancaster University. Um, and this is part of the Digital Bodies seminar series. So we've had there's four um, in the series now. I'll put the links in the chat. Um, thinking about various aspects um, of digital bodies, and that's quite broadly defined. So this is as part of um, Lancaster University do an um, a feminist and media cultural studies summer school. Um, and this seminar series kind of leads up to that. The theme of that this year is on digital bodies. Um, so we have two more seminars coming up. Um, the next one is Oscar, um, Oscar Zhu, who is doing about algorithmic gay sexualities on Doyin. Um, and that's coming up. And that's next week, actually. Um, and then we've got Nikim coming up as well, um, which is on vulnerability and control, queer men, smartphones and cultures of intimacy. Um, so both of those are coming up along the same theme, if this is something that you're interested in. Um, auto captions are available on Teams. If you click on the three dots, you can scroll down and you can turn auto captions on um, if you would like them. Um, if people wouldn't mind just having their mic um, and their camera off until we get to the discussion part, um, just because it's, it can be a bit of noise. Um, and then at the discussion part later on, you can turn them on if you want. Um, so we're really, really pleased to have um, Angela Jones here to do our, our seminar, uh, our talk today. Um, so Angela, I taught your work on the MA course that, that some of the students are doing and that it was like the most popular thing we did. <laughs> they loved it. Um, so that's why I ask you. Um, so Angela Jones is a professor of sociology at Farmingdale State College um, at State University of New York. And her research interests include African-American political thought and protest, sex work, race, gender, sexuality, feminist theory and queer methodologies and theory. And the talk today is coming money, power and pleasure in the sex work industry. Thank you, Angela. everyone. Um, so first, I want to thank uh, Laura Clancy and everyone at the Center for Gender and Women's Studies for inviting me to participate in your feminist media studies series on digital bodies. And of course, a big thank you to everyone uh, who is here today for being here. Um, so today, as Laura noted, I'm going to discuss my book, Camming Money, Power and Pleasure in the Sex Work Industry. Um, I just want to note that this is an abridged version of the talk that I usually give. Um, so I'm looking forward to the Q&A where we can talk more in depth about various themes in the book that either I didn't capture um, or that I moved through somewhat uh, quickly. Uh, in this talk, I tell a few stories about the amazing people who shared their lives with me and how their stories provide a really unique vantage point from which to understand and theorize around sexuality gender, race, and labor in a time when workers globally face increasing economic precariousness, worsened forms of alienation, and desperately desire to recapture pleasure in work. Now, before I introduce you to some of my research participants, I want to talk just a little bit about my intellectual and methodological commitments. And in doing so, this will also provide more information regarding my trigger warning about the pornographic images um, in the talk. Uh, my investments in critical pedagogy guided the writing of the book, just as Black, feminist, and queer methods guide my research. I'd argue that my home discipline of sociology, um, it's still too often invested in what I see as conservative, epistemological, and methodological traditions that actively silence marginalized voices and scholars, and I want to actively disrupt these traditions. It's why, for example, I think scholars need to adopt methods such as progressive stacking. Um, as many of you know, um, activists use progressive stacking during their meetings to structure the flow of dialogue and ensure that marginalized people's voices are heard and that they have a voice in all decision making. So, for example, here in the U.S., um, as part of the Occupy Wall Street movement, um, activists emphasize that people who have been historically marginalized by the systems of, say, capitalism, white supremacy, cis sexism, heterosexism, ableism, right, should always speak before those who are privileged by these systems. So in the book, I use a progressive stack in the presentation of all data, quantitative, qualitative, and try to really center the voices of the most marginal whenever possible. As another example, 
um, I use a pornographic imagination. And again, to serve as a trigger warning, please be aware that I do not censor my participants' labor. And I think that we need less censoring of sex and more attention to what we can learn from the pornographic. Finally, I decided to also use a few autoethnographic vignettes and stories about my experiences as a former sex worker. Autoethnography can help us to push back against positivist sciences that often silence black and other people of color, poor people, trans people, and people such as sex workers um, whose society too often sees as deviant and whose voices are deemed invalid. Finally, I just I really like to tell folks like up front that my work is unapologetically political and I want the work I do to help the marginalized people that I write about. So in overview, um, as I come to learn, despite my focus on pleasure in the book, the camming industry is no utopian paradise. It's an exploitative capitalist market that also reproduces other systems um, such as white supremacy and patriarchy and ableism and so on. However, it is also an industry where cam models report high rates of job satisfaction and experiences of pleasure. For many cam models in the study, the industry presented an opportunity to earn relatively decent wages, Camp performers, like all sex workers, are motivated to perform erotic labor for myriad of reasons, many of which are not only about money. The physical safety found in online sex work can be appealing to people who ordinarily would not perform offline erotic labor. So the burgeoning erotic webcam industry is part of a rapidly and exponentially growing online global network of sex work industries. These are exciting times to be living in then, right? A period of increased sexual commerce and sexual exploration. I believe the growth of online sexual commerce will continue to push cultural mores forward, challenging hegemonic neo-Victorian discourses that regulate sexual pleasure. If my research on the camming industry and my brief background as a sex worker have taught me anything, it's that sex workers have always been on the front line of the struggle for human and sexual freedom. And here are a few of the people um, that I learned this from. So this is Tiffany. Uh, Tiffany began working as a cam model in 2015. She strategically, herself in, she strategically brands herself in the ebony category on cam sites. Um, and when we spoke, she was making approximately $1,200 a month. Tiffany is one of many cam models throughout the world who work in a camming studio. So while many cam models broadcast on cam sites from home, many also work in spaces owned by sex entrepreneurs called studios, right? And so these are physical studios, often most prevalent, uh, prevalent excuse me, in places like Colombia and Romania. Um, and they're buildings that have individual rooms for models to cam. They're equipped with a computer, HD webcam, quality lighting. Studios are popular in regions where access to technology is limited. And while many advertisements make camming seem accessible to all, the reality is that many people around the world do not have access to stable internet connections at home, and many do not have the money for proper lighting, a computer, and webcam. So studios are appealing to people who don't have access to these resources or private spaces in which to work. Also, broadly, the market privileges white bodies and native English speakers, especially from the US. So English is a dominant language used in the industry and global white supremacy also means that white cis men from the West are often unwilling to communicate with cam models who quote unquote, don't speak English well. Thus in places such as Colombia and Romania, the studio provides cam models with things like English classes and again, other forms of support. So, Anyway, so Tiffany and I are talking about um, studio work, and she says, um, well, I'm going to be honest. There's a lot of pros and cons working for a studio. The pros of working for a studio is you have space. If a guy wants to be a creep and wants to check your IP address and just be all types of weird, he will find the studio. He won't find your actual home. I can say that I felt safe. I like being around other girls who are doing this. It kind of helps giving tips and tricks. What the hell? It's a slow ass night. Let's go talk. The cons? I mean, they be taking a lot of our money. That sucks. Every time I make a hundred bucks, I only get 20 out of it. That sucks. 
and them owning my name. So if I ever want to start over, I'd have to make a whole new account. I couldn't take my you know, stage name with me, and that sucks. So working for a studio provides cam models with an added layer of safety. While cam models like Tiffany have found community on camming and enjoy their work, camming is still an exploitative industry. As Tiffany explains, if she makes $100 and the campsite takes half, and then the studio takes a cut, and out of that $100, she's only left with 20 USD. So also, if she leaves the studio, she cannot take her stage name with her. So again, separating from the studio means she'll need to cam under a whole new manufactured identity, and she could lose her following. Next up, let me introduce you to Adeline. Uh, when we spoke, Adeline had been camming for two and a half years and was making about $1,500 a month. Adeline is one of many trans women I spoke with who talked with me about the difficulties of finding work as a trans femme person. Trans women face multiple forms of discrimination in the economy and society at large, and as a result, were the group most likely to begin camming purely out of economic necessity. Camming provides a relatively stable source of income in a safe environment for people who face rampant and legally sanctioned discrimination in the economy, as well as other institutions. Now, while Adel and I talked about dealing with trans exclusionary campsites and transphobic trolls, we also spent significant time discussing what she saw as the benefits of this work. Camming as a pathway to affirmation was a popular refrain from cam models with a range of non-normative embodiments. In the book, in the chapter on kink, Adeline and I talked about how camming was a way for her to explore her sexuality, affirm her gender, and experience gender euphoria. For those not familiar, gender, gender euphoria is defined as a profound sense of elation one feels when stereotypical gender roles are disrupted through a self-conscious or unconscious act of subversion and a temporary yet euphoric sense of cultural release occurs. So Ellen says to me, I, I didn't really realize that I was like a sub, so the whole submissive BDSM thing developed from camming. As Adeline received requests from Dom clients to perform and interact in shows as a submissive, she explained to me that she felt like she was entering onto a path of, of self-discovery. And you know, Adeline's sexual journey is not just about discovering her submissive self, it's also simultaneously about pushing boundaries related to her gender identity in ways that bring her multiple and overlapping pleasures. So in this show, um, Adeline is told to write the word sissy on her chest. And she explained to me, uh, just me um, and so she explained to me, I never identified as a sissy. I think as a result, I felt less restricted by my own gender related insecurities. Throughout my camming career, I would have my soft limits pushed further away. Being called the word sissy was a soft limit for me because I worked so hard in real life to be treated equally with other women, and I didn't like the implications of being called a sissy. So Adeline has the opportunity to explore her sexuality through submissive role play and to get paid pretty well for doing it. In our conversation, she called herself a subspace junkie. In BDSM communities, subspace refers to a psychological state achieved by a submissive in a bottoming place scene. So for Adeline, being in subspace means she could push her boundaries, which for her, she said, produces this feeling of freedom. Importantly, Adeline noted that it's the rapport and trust that she and her client have built over time that makes their play more than just a service. Their intimate bond is why she can push her own limits, experience gender euphoria, and enjoy exploring her desires for submissive role play while working. Adeline's story, I think, is also a note to social scientists, right? Experiences of marginality are not only experiences of trauma and pain inflicted by and within systems of stratification. In our attention to inequity, we must make room for pleasure and joy. For Adeline, Yes, yeah, she deals with trans misogyny all the time in work, but we actually spent most of our time talking about trans joy, not trans pain. 
And to step back into the autoethnographic for a moment, for me, being Black, being queer are not burdens, but the basis of community and constant immeasurable joy, right? So now for the sake of, of time in this talk, I'm just going to jump ahead um, a bunch of slides. Um, uh, let's see. Let's jump back in with Aaron. Okay. Um, so this is Aaron. Uh, in his three years of camming, Aaron told me he was only making at the time about $300 a month camming. Um, and, but when he spends more time camming at the time, he said he still had a day job. Um, and so there were times where he was making as much as 1200 Just, um, just, uh, just a little uh, note on Aaron. Um, I actually keep in touch with many of the folks um, in this research project and other research projects. Um, and Aaron quit his day job and is now making significantly more than he was at the time of this research, um, which made him very happy. Um, so Aaron and I are talking. Um, and he says to me, you know, we're talking about motivations, right? Like why are folks entering this industry? And he says, well, you know, money was a huge issue because, you know, the average job in Hungary pays around less than $1,000 a month. If you're working in retail, you make, say, $400 a month. And then you turn on your webcam and you can make thousands of dollars from home within a few hours a day. So there's a huge um, difference. Um, so it's critical to note that it's the failures of global capitalism and capitalist industries to provide workers living wages that drive people out of camp. Comments such as Aaron's also, for me, underscore the importance of place and geography in conditioning these economic motivations. When I spoke with Aaron, we also talked a lot about masculinity and embodiment, and I thought this particular conversation would be particularly relevant for the work um, that you're doing as part of this series. Um, so for male cam models, there's this expectation that their bodies be lean and muscular, right? Like Aaron and I discussed his tattoos um, pictured on the slide and the ways that his tattoos helped him market himself to clients um, who are very focused on young and muscular, hyper-masculine bodies. Now, there are fields such as bars and events catering to bears, where gay men, for example, with more massive physiques have enormous sexual capital. However, in the camming field, like most sex industries, gay, fat, hairy men have low sexual capital. While, for example, there's a thriving niche market of big, beautiful women and supersized big, beautiful women, um, there's no real market for fat men in camming. Um, Aaron also noted that the cam industry places greater scrutiny on male bodies and shows more appreciation for diversity among female models. And I asked Aaron to tell me a little bit more about that particular point. And he says, you know, I think it is harder for men. Yes, regarding the body type, it's definitely harder. Also, with gay people in my room, they usually just want to see my dick or my ass or they want to see me come or jerk it or whatever. And that's basically it. Um, yeah, that's it. No real, nothing really extreme. And then you don't have too much fantasy there. But with the girl performers, you have, I don't know, you could write a whole book just with the names of fetishes and the kind of requests people are asking. So according to Aaron and other cis men I spoke with, gay sexual scripts often mean that male clients request a, a limited repertoire of sex acts and often focus on immediate gratification, as in the client who enters his room and immediately demands to see his dick. These scripts can adversely affect the earnings of male cam models. Cis men often expressed to me that they felt pressured by clients to do what I call drop, pop, and roll. So while many clients want to talk and develop intimate bonds with performers, many of the men with whom I spoke suggested that masculinity shape their performances of sex in different ways from how femininity was shaping the performances of their female peers. Now, male performers face what Michael jo Johnson has called the ejaculation imperative, right? So in the sexual field of camming, US-centric discourses of masculinity shape the imperative to drop, pop, and roll, right? So aggression characterizes hyper-masculine sexual scripts. The performance of sex is not a slow or romantic encounter, right? Performing masculinity diminishes the pleasure that many um, men performers experience while performing sex. Moreover, hyper-masculine gendered scripts can have an adverse effect on wages. Now, 
a key finding in the research um, is that in what Mears and Connell call display industries, the gendered pay gap is inverted. So women's in the sample, women's wages far exceeded men's. While trans women earned on average an extra thousand dollars a month, cis women um, average twelve fifty a month, and cis men only average three hundred and fifty a month. It's critical that in my sample, while not representative, trans women made almost as much as cis women. But what I explore in the book is how trans women's experiences of this work are qualitatively different, even if their wages are similar to cis women's. Now. One explanation for the inversion of the traditional gendered wage gap is that there's simply a higher demand for sexual services performed by women than men in the field. However, what I also show is that this wage gap is also a reflection of the gendered and racialized sexual scripts that performers draw on in creating manufactured identities and performing sex in this field. So in performing masculinity and adhering to gay sexual scripts, male cam models are at a disadvantage. Think of it this way. If a performer does a private show at $3.99 a minute, a male performer who is instructed to only jerk off to climax will make less than a female performer who has a lengthy conversation, then a strip tease long before she even touches her genitals. Also, the camming field values what I call in the book embodied authenticity and women's performances are more likely to be read as authentic. Unlike those of cis men who are often caught up in what many important studies have called gay for pay stigma, right? And so they're seen almost as these deceitful performers who are only out to make a buck, right? This finding is actually quite in line with popular cultural imagery that fetishizes female bisexuality and at the same time mistrusts and demonizes male bisexuality. So I think it's a crucial finding that display industries are currently the only markets where women out earn men. What does it suggest everyone that the only industries in which women have advantages over men are industries in which women must display their bodies? On the one hand, this situation reifies the idea that women's most significant and only assets are their bodies and beauty, which is sexist. However, the performances women provide clients are not just the source of wages. These shows in many cases also empower women, provide them with pleasure. Thus, there's absolutely nothing wrong with women using sexual capital just as they would economic, social, symbolic, or cultural capital. And again, I'm just gonna jump ahead here just so that I can kind of get to um, some of the summarizing slides and we have plenty of time to talk. Um, so we're gonna, bye-bye, Ronnie. Um, so <laughs> these are just a few of the stories. Um, again, the book is very, very focused on the voices and narratives um, of the performers. So these were just a, a few in the book. But I want to pause for a second, and you didn't get to see all of the, the cam models profiled in the slides, but there's something really interesting that even in the models profiled in this talk um, demonstrate, and it's about the kind of distribution of wages. Um, so, and what we ultimately notice is that, and over the course of the slides, is um, who's earning the most, right? There's a trend in terms of who's earning the most in these industries. So keep in mind, oh, we're gonna talk, I just saw that comment, My all my new research is on trans masculine and non-binary people, so please ask me that question during the q and I, I, I kind of want to answer it now, but I'll come back to it. Um, you got it. Um, so, um, so keep in mind, I spoke with full-time cam models who earn a lot. Like Alicia in the book makes $11,000 a month and one month she made like $54,000. You know, I spoke with Tanya in the book who makes like $10,000 a month and also told me that one month, you know, a good month, um, she made like 25,000. But, you know, again, I want you to think about what you think all of those top grossing models have in common. Right. Um, and it's ultimately that that disproportionately the people who are earning a lot of money in this industry, thin, white, cisgender women in their 20s, disproportionately from the U.S. Right. Had the highest wages uh, in the in, in the sample. And so while advertisements, um, sorry. So while advertisements like these <laughs> um, tell potential cam models that they can earn ten thousand dollars a week for most um, for most cam models, Horatio Alger dies hard. 
right? CAM models' identities affect both their experiences, CAMing, and their wages. So to be clear, this is far from a feminist, queer, or economic utopia, right? And the CAMing industry provides decent wages to workers in the sample, but also the industry still operates via and reproduces some of the same inequities that exist in any capitalist workplace. Um, so again, just to summarize, let me, okay. Um, why have people gravitated towards this online market? Well, it's complicated. The CAM models in the book come from such diverse physical and social locations. So yes, again, the failures of global capitalism and capitalist industries to buy, provide workers living wages drive people to CAM, but their subjectivities, right? Their identities also shape their motivations. So as another example, I spoke with and highlight the stories of people with disabilities who talked to me about their difficulty finding work due to institutionalized ableism, right? And they explained, you know, marginalization occurs because employers and other institutions see specific embodiments as not productive, right? So certain bodies have little to no value to capitalist production. And so the, uh, the online sex workers I spoke to, especially disabled ones, push back on these kind of capitalist white supremacist and ableist notions of productivity. So a core argument in the book is that examining worker embodiment and its relationship to economic marginalization is essential to fully understand why people choose to enter the camming industry and to understand workers' experiences, frankly, in any marketplace. And by the way, the themes of embodiment and disability are central to my newest research and publications on the workplace experiences of trans men and non-binary escorts. And so, um, as I was saying to, I think, uh, to someone in the audience, I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. Um, rounding up and looking at the time, I might actually stop here in a moment. Um, so another core argument in the book is that labor scholars should not miss the point that the acquisition and experience of pleasure is a social force that shapes and guides labor market participation. Since capitalist production can often strip the joy from labor, people search for occupations where they can still be artists or masters of a craft and through their artistry find some kind of pleasure in their work. Right, so contemporary workers are trying to reclaim the joys of craftsmanship by selling their homemade crafts on Etsy. You know, women have fun at work by facilitating parties where they sell sex toys using their social networks. People craft and sell their own beer, right? So in some ways, I'd argue that CAM models are just one cohort of workers who are seeking freedom from alienated labor and who are also seeking to reconcile um, pleasure with their labor. And I see we're just at about 11.30. So I think I'm going to stop there and just um, talk to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's wonderful. Um, really interesting things, particularly about the labour bit. I was really interested in that. And that was fascinating. Um, so I think we've got, and if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, or if you, if you want to put your hand up, I can come to you and you can ask it. That would also be nice. Um, but to start with, Andrew, there are a couple of people in the chat who are very excited about this trans men non-binary sex work. Would you like to start with that one? <laughs> uh, let me go to the chat for a second. Uh, wondering if trans men also done in the study on uh, non-binary sex work. Okay, yes, I see. Um, so um, do you folks want to kind of elaborate on the question? Do you just want me to talk a little bit more about the newer work? I am I'm here to talk about whatever you want. Um, thank you so much, and this is phenomenal. I feel so privileged to be able to attend this, so thank you. Um, yeah, no, I guess uh, also if you're if you have some knowledge you're able to share about where is there some more safe spaces in order to do something such as camming that doesn't always elicit the same demographic of people. Um, so typically if it's speaking of like cis white men, for example, um, especially as a, a trans person or a queer person, where are the spaces that it's not always going to be hit with the same that type of clientele? That's a great question. Um, and so should I start with the, the kind of trans men piece or do you want me? And then I'll also the safe spaces piece because that also gets at, I think there are some newer developments in the market that I'm really excited about, Dylan, um, especially in relationship to, I think we're seeing some shifts. So I guess maybe I'm going to talk about the safe space question. For 
first. Uh, but I think there have been some really interesting shifts in. So, uh, OK, so folks know OnlyFans. We know OnlyFans, right? OK, so there's um, a newer platform called Just for Fans. It's created by sex workers, run by sex workers, and it is kind of in many ways billed as this again, this sex worker led, run, created, intentional space as an alternative for, um, you know, to OnlyFans. In the, the escort market, right, which is a lot of the research that I'm doing now, um, folks were talking about the development of platforms that again, being, so for example, the folks who started Twitter, um, the sex worker alternative to Twitter, um, which unfortunately, um, anyway, um, so also started a platform to get away from, so in the escort industry, um, there are there are a few dominant players, sex entrepreneurs who run those sites. They are not sex workers. They are wealthy, affluent white men. And so sex workers were saying, look, we need a platform. And I want to be clear, some of this is about recouping the, the, the money, right, that's being taken by <laughs> folks who aren't actually laboring in the industry. But I think a lot of it also had to do, Dylan, with trying to create, as you're describing, these kind of space spaces. And I think inclusionary spaces. So one of the things that I've been talking to folks a lot about in my research is now is specifically about how cisgenderism, cissexism, transmisogyny, really like they're built into the actual design of this market, especially in terms of the platforms, right? So, you know, talking to trans men um, who work, you know, as escorts who are saying, look, I go to access these sites that are designed for men and like they'll have these mandatory drop down menus that'll say, you know, how big is your penis? But it begins at like five, six inches or something like that. And they're like, well, not that, not that big, um, you know, or asking them about their height. Right, and and it'll begin at five seven or something like that. And so these are just a couple of examples of the you know exclusionary ways that a lot of these platforms are built. Then in the camming industry, same thing. It and there's actually been a very recent development on one of the major cam platforms, which was the first. And this was like two three weeks ago. And I and I know because of my relationship with them, they were they've been working on this for a year or two now. Where they finally launched. Um, very specific trans categories. So, so Chatterbait used to have tabs for men, women, and trans and couples. Now they've broken down finally that trans category to recognize, it's still limited, right? But that at least recognizes trans femme, trans masculine, non-binary, and actually gives a space um, for folks. And so I think, so and I think there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of cultivating these safe spaces that you're asking about and these inclusionary spaces. But I am always constantly, um, I don't know, reassured by sex worker activism and the work that folks are doing, because I think we are seeing some examples of sex workers in particular who are really trying to push back on these industry dynamics and create these more inclusionary and safe spaces. But I also, I mean, that was... That was maybe the overly optimistic version of things in that there's again there's still a lot of work to do because on most platforms for example in the camming industry they're they're not you know they're not designed for trans and non-binary people and so kind of bringing in the first question a little bit um you know one of the things that really struck me you know i think whenever you produce a book you you have this you know extensive robust research there's always limitations and there are always things that you wish you had done or things that you wish you had seen and it really struck me and i was really bothered by the absence of trans masculine and non-binary folks and and especially with non-binary and mb folks you know i was thinking well it's not that and i kind of knew right like it's not that there aren't any you know non-binary folks working on these platforms but because of that design of the platforms, these are folks who are forced and many folks, especially non-binary AFAB folks who said to me, look, like I basically, in order for baseline workplace participation, in order for me to participate, I have to perform cis femininity, right? Or in other words, I had to still pretend to be a woman, which in many cases, especially when I was talking to escorts about their experiences in places like brothels and, and others who are saying like, look, especially for those who talk to me about having dysphoria, they said, you know, having to perform in these ways really exacerbates my dysphoria. And it's like, and especially for escorts, they talked about, you know, you know, they're forcing me to perform as a woman, right? Which means that um, now I'm kind of dissociating 
just so that I can perform the service. And especially in the context of full service sex work, you know, if you're dissociating, this can people describe things like stealthing and, you know, the removal without consent of, you know, condoms and stuff. And, you know, so there's some safety risks and concerns there too when people have to perform in these ways. So, you know, as hopeful as I am about some of these new trends that we've seen, you know, again, these industries, and, and I'm going to wrap it up, I promise, but like, these industries are so sexist, so right, like, and it's literally embedded into the design of these spaces. Um, you know, I mean, and then in pornography, I think there's been a longer history of the creation of, for example, trans masculine pornography, queer porn, ethical porn, right, feminist porn. So I think that, again, I'll leave on a hopeful note and say that I guess part of me hopes that some of the progress that we've seen in porn in traditional pornographic industries begin to kind of branch out into um, other spaces like camming. Thank you so, so much. Absolutely. Thank you. And again, this is such an honor to be able to have this conversation um, with you and, and that you're sharing this with us. So thank you. My pleasure. And Dylan, if you want, um, I'm happy to share my email address. If you if you want to get in touch with me, um, I can share some of the articles that, that have come out thus far. Or if you wanted to chit chat a little bit more outside of the seminar, you just, you know, you hit me up. OK, um, but I think especially some of those readings, I think will um, will be right up the alley what you're looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. That was a great question. It kind of reminded me when you were speaking as well, all the stuff about um, like gender and race and algorithms and stuff and like the way we assume that these things are neutral, right? Yeah. But actually they're built by humans and they're built by humans with you know particular viewpoints. And I think that's something that's really interesting to think about kind of gender online and stuff. Um, Macy, I can't see your second name. I'm sorry, but you've, you've had your hand up for a while. Would you like to come on? Yeah. Um, listen. <laughs> I was so excited when I saw that you were giving a talk about this book because I just found this book, started reading it online and had to pause because I've got to buy it in person. I got to have it in my hands. I got to fill the margins with my notes. I'm so excited because um, I am big on sex worker activism. I've been in the sex industry in several different areas from being a sex worker to marketing to you know, now being a sex worker again because those PhD stipends. Um, <laughs> but I, I am also like Dylan. Um, I know Dylan was granted permission for your email, but I would also love those articles because I, as a non-binary online sex worker, have consistently marketed myself as female. And one of my professors was kind of like, why have you not written about this yet? And um, that search kind of led me to your book because right now I'm doing a study about um, uh, like labor and the biocracy and biopower through um, online sex work. So, but you kind of answered my question that I originally had my hand raised for, and I've got maybe like five or six questions per chapter that I've already read in your book. So I'm gonna kind of try and condense it down. Sorry, I'm just rambling. Um, but one of the things that really interested me, especially with some of the initial interviews that I've already had with some people, is I know um, somewhere in your book and then another article I read that cited your book talked about um, studying older members of um, the sex worker communities. And I was just wondering what is defined as old in your opinion? Because like we said, like, the the 20 marketing yourself as you know like newly 18 is kind of um this this look so i was like would 35 be considered older sex workers um and i'm just so excited to hear that you've already started working on um more more research around trans and non-binary people thank you very much i'll, I'll stop rambling now no, 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 that's fine. Please, we don't forget. And and um, I did, I dropped my email and I apologize. I'm not the best multitasker because I was trying to actively listen and type at the same time. So it is the second one. I left out the E in the first time, but please. Um, and so um, Macy, please feel free to um, drop me an email for those articles. Again, we can also chit chat a little bit more because it sounds like you had multiple questions, um, which I'm also happy to um, to answer kind of asynchronously offline. Um, so, I mean, how do I define older sex worker <laughs> or how does the industry define such things? Um, and I think the industry itself has a very 
<laughs> um, if I'm editorializing unreasonable <laughs> um, standard <laughs> or sensibilities about what constitutes an older person or older body. I mean, I think once you, you know, reach your you know, your mid thirties, I think, as you had suggested, I think they're already kind of pushing you to work in the mature category, right? Uh, <laughs> um, uh, in those ways. Um, but I can tell you that in the sample of CAM models, it ranged from, you know, 18, 19 years old. The oldest person in my sample um, was a cis man who was 72. Um, but one of the things that I also write in the book that I think is interesting about age is that it's one of these categories that um, you know, CAM models, but I would say sex workers more broadly, um, you know, actively create these uh, manufactured identities, right? Um, I mean, as you know, and so it's the one category that people are kind of actively manipulating, right? Because folks know that if the end, the industry standard is at the minute I hit 30 something, I'm considered mature. So, you know, most folks in the sample, you know, would say, look, on my online profile, it says that I'm 26, but I'm really 36. You know, and so there's a lot of um, kind of manipulation as far as identity categories. It was the one that and sexuality. People were most likely um, to list themselves as bisexual um, and most likely to kind of manufacture their age down such that they could keep with the industry standards and, and understandings of, you know, of um, uh, sexual capital and, and sexual value that, in my opinion, are quite ageist. Right? <laughs> um, was there. Did you want to kind of follow up a little bit? Do you feel like that answered the question well? No, yeah, that answers the question. Um, I've just been interested in how many, just with people I've talked to in my communities, how many like Facebook mommy groups all decide to get into fetish selling together, like panty selling. Um, so speaking of, you know, like as, as sex work and like sex industry grows, like some of the boundaries are pushed. I've just been interested how mommy groups are getting into this when typically you think of the the parent teacher alliance as the one who's you know so against pornography and sex no i think that's brilliant um i think that's brilliant and i wonder absolutely as these industries continue to grow and and we know that they're you know increasingly you know interconnected but as these industries continue to grow and i think this is something anecdotally that i think we saw with kind of only fans right this kind of populations of people who I think we would typically say, you know, weren't, you know, doing sex work, were moving into sex work. So I think it's really interesting to investigate. And I kind of wish you all the best in that project and kind of thinking about, you know, maybe some of these newer developments in the industry are also bringing in um, older, <laughs> you know, older people. There's a couple of comments in the, um, in the chat, so about MILF which kind of immediately comes to mind around that. And then also there were 30 year old categorized as teens. So I suppose how it could go both ways. Thank you, Macy. Um, Helen, you got your hand up. Hi, Angela. Um, thank you for coming to talk to us. And um, thanks for sharing your research, which is fascinating. And uh, I can't wait to read the book more fully. But um, I um, wanted to ask you a question really about whether or not you talk to your um, participants about unions <laughs> or unionising or, or whether that how that language because it's not popular language in content creation is it content creators are sometimes suspicious of it you know whether yeah. that's porn or not you know um, and I wondered whether <coughs> how they articulate a relationship to that which might be helpful for them or whether there was a difference between those who worked for the studios and those who, you know, whether they might feel more like that was a space they could articulate a language through that, they have an opposition in a way that's more direct. Um, so I just wondered, you know, I wondered about how in this new landscape, forms of collectivity are being thought and rethought, I guess, in a way that might be helpful for more people more broadly, I think. If you could say something about that, would be great. Thank you so much, Helen. I think there's a wonderful question. It's something that I thought quite a bit about. It's something that I talked to a number of, uh, of CAM models about. Um, and specifically, some did specifically use the language of unions. Um, I think there was just broader discussion of kind of a need for people in this particular industry to mobilize, right? Whether that's vis-a-vis -a, -vis a union or just, you know, the same way we see this groundswell, you know, there's been so much sex worker activism, I think, 
primarily um, by full service sex workers. I think some of the cam models that I talked to th talked about, you know, basically saying like, I wish that there was more activism. I wish that there's an entire chapter, for example, in the book on community. And that was something I heard a lot, even in the slide on Tiffany, right? Talking about how one of the things that I really love about this sp these spaces is that they often feel like community, right? So instead of seeing each other in this competitive way, right, that there's this tendency to want to support one another, right, generate traffic for other cam models, you know, provide there are all these new web forums where people are providing one another with, you know, all forms of support, instrumental, I can write all for social, emotional, right, all these different forms of support. And then I talked to a number of cam models who said, you know, we're really good at building these, this community, but it's not translating in a, into kind of political mobilization in ways that some of the, the folks that I talked to said they wish they'd see. You know, I'm thinking of um, one cam model, Amelia, in the book from the UK, who talked a lot about this with me and said, you know, you know, and she'd been in the industry for a really long time. And she said, you know, I've seen so many shifts. The market has become so saturated it, in it just in terms of how many people are working on these platforms. You know, we know what happens to wages, right? When there's so many people in a market, you know, my wages have gone down. Should look even qualitatively, the work that I'm performing feels um, sometimes more exhausting. Or in the case of Amelia, you know, she talked about how, you know, she felt like there was now an increased demand to do things that actually don't bring her pleasure or things that maybe are outside of her comfort zone, right? Just to continue to remain competitive. Um, and she said, I really wish that we were organized because it seems that the level of exploitation that we're facing is increasing, but yet there's no real movement to whether it's unionized or towards any real kind of political mobilization. And I think that one of the things that I came up with through the data and thinking about like kind of why this is happening. Um, and it seemed to me a lot like, you know, so sex workers often talk about the hierarchy, right? And so, you know, and so folks in the audience, this idea that, um, you know, there's many different forms of sexual labor. And while we might say it is all stigmatized, it's not stigmatized evenly, right? So people who maybe work in phone sex or in strip clubs, right, are on the top of this heart, this hierarchy, whereas people who are doing full service work, especially those who are doing street-based work, right, face the most stigma, they're criminalized, face the most harm, you know, threats of violence, so forth and so on. And so thus, it's been the people who have been on the bottom of that hierarchy who have been the most responsible for sex worker activism because their lives are threatened every day by the state, right? And so these are folks. And so what I found interesting in my data was that the folks that I spoke to who had overlapping industry experience, right? So when I first came to this project, it was initially tentatively titled, But I'm a Model. Because it was really interesting to me that initially some of the cam models that I was talking to were like, didn't identify as sex workers, and I don't mean that in a judgmental way, right, but didn't identify as sex workers and, and only identified themselves as models, you know, and again, kind of thinking about this hierarchy and kind of saying, well, what I'm doing is different than what these other sex workers are doing. And so some of what I talked about with some of the cam models was how to get how to potentially raise the consciousness of some cam models who maybe don't Ask. necessarily want to, you know, work through some of the exploitative, you know, elements of the labor. Um, but certainly for cam models that I spoke to who had experience in full service markets, these were the folks who were the most likely um, to call for um, political mobilization. But I will say most of most folks in that category did not talk about unionization. It was, you know, we want full decrim, like these kind of broader, uh, what I would say kind of social justice models, right? Like, so we want economic justice, we want an end to racial injustice, right? Kind of um, thinking about these broader um, justice issues. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, of all the, of all the industries that are supposed to be the most competitive, the most neoliberal, the most driven by algorithms, the most driven by competition, the human spirit <laughs> seeks out support, community and all of those things in in all of those spaces at the same time, doesn't it? And I think that's what's kind of it's kind of warming, but it's how do we, you know, as they were saying, how do we translate that to better protections? better support, better pay, better, you know, if the studio is taking seven, you know, 80% of 
of income off the top, how could you gather together to change those kinds of dynamics? You know, it's kind of, I don't know, I guess, I guess some of the, some of the ways I'm starting to feel about the kind of support networks is that they sometimes ameliorate the inequality and, and maybe that, that needs to be, that's why those two things need to be thought about together as a dynamic that, you know, potentially help to reproduce each other, maybe, I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, it's fascinating, fascinating yeah. work. Yeah. And I, I sometimes wonder if folks feel that what they're getting vis-a-vis -vis sex worker community is what they need, right? Mm -hmm. I remember during COVID kind of, you know, people asking a lot about kind of, you know, sex work and, and COVID and what's happened to folks. And I always tell folks, look, you know, the world could get a master class in mutual aid from sex workers. These are populations of folks who, you know, because, especially vis-a-vis -vis the state, but also say here in the US context from kind of right wing religious groups kind of is always under attack from all of these, you know, outside forces that sometimes there's a reluctance to even want to join that broader, right, if you will, to join those broader systems and to just say, look, you know, we're going to stay over here. We're going to support one another. Right. We're going to. And when I say mutual, like during COVID, just seeing all of the economic support, instrumental support, you need a bed, you need housing, you need money. Like folks were just showing up and showing out for one another. And so maybe there are folks who that is the solution for them for now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Helen. Thank you, Angela. Um, so we've got a question in the chat. Um, which is, my name is Selena and I work for Stella, a buying for sex worker organisation that offers sex work specific services like work supplies, medical, legal clinics, mobilisation activities and outreach. We've historically had some challenges in reaching CAM workers, so I was wondering if the folks you spoke to had specific needs for services or outreach that they had difficulty accessing. Mm, so great question. And specific to the CAM industry, um, in terms of specific needs or insurance services, they had difficulty accessing. Um, I think the primary um, thing that came up, um, we talked a lot about in our interviews, we talked a lot about stigma and thinking about who one can feel like they can be out with. Um, and for Kim, I was saying, like, look, like I you know, would say like, I block entire, you know, areas, you know, in addition to IP addresses, entire areas, because, you know, I also have this job. And if these people find out, right, like I need to maintain that anonymity or, um, you know, if my family finds out or if, you know, my mother's best friend sees me, whatever. Um, and so I think that folks also talked quite a bit about the, the effects of that stigma, you know, potential feelings of isolation. And so all of that is to say that, I know that there's a large organization that provides specific um, counseling and therapeutic services um, for sex workers, um, but I think that this was something that folks talked about wishing that they had uh, more access to. So counseling, mental health services um, that were industry specific. So talking to providers who they can feel that they can speak to without risk of judgment. So um, in that research, I would say, in the camming research, I would say that, again, having knowledgeable, um, preferably, you know, I mean, even, you know, uh, counselors who have industry experience, right, was something that folks talked about wishing that they had access to. Great. Yeah. And Katie says in the chat, I don't think the mutual aid skills of sex workers are coincidental, considering the number of queer, black, disabled and other minority marginalised folks in these communities. Look at their organisation during the AIDS crisis, for example. I, can I just add one more thing? Because I know that, um, you know, you asked specifically about the camming industry, but I can say with the newer research projects, um, specifically on trans masculine, non-binary folks, disabled sex workers, um, I, and especially for those full service providers, um, a lot of those folks talked about needing access to a wide range of services that were gender inclusive. And again, working with different, a wide range of social, social service providers who uh, kind of have some knowledge or even frankly, um, who said, and this is a new article that just came out, people need to know we exist. This is like one of the things that I heard across those interviews that like if social service providers even acknowledged that trans masculine and non-binary people were working in this industry, that that in and of itself would be, um, you know, would, would, would be an improvement, right? Um, 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, Katie, do you have a quick question that can be asked in three minutes? <laughs> um, you know me, Laura, so I will be as quick as physically <laughs> possible. Um, yeah, just on this this subject of mutual aid, because this is kind of my uh, ADHD uh, hyper focus of my PhD of the week. Um, just going back to what you said about the um, sex workers looking to create their own platforms, and this is something I've kind of I've heard of Twitter and stuff before. I'm I'm just wondering, kind of, if you could speak just very quickly in terms of, you know, kind of, is there is there a likelihood of these things kind of, you know, taking off, or given the the competition with things like, you know, these massive companies like OnlyFans, for example. You know, I mean, I, I assume that's kind of the key challenge to these things, but um, yeah, just just really quickly, if you could say any more on that. Thank you so much for that, Katie, and and it's it's interesting because. Um, and I'm glad you asked the question because when we were talking a little bit, you know, I was talking to Dylan about the, these kind of newer platforms, I stopped myself um, for the sake of time. But I think it's important to note that there are significant limitations. It's incredibly problematic for us to place the sole burden of transforming an entire industry on, you know, um, on sex workers and specifically in this case on queer, trans, disabled sex workers, right? That like, in order to make the type of shifts that my sense already is that many of us would like to see happen in these markets, I mean, you're talking about enormous amounts of resources and capital, both in terms of time, money, cultural capital, in terms of knowledge, right? Like I've talked to, especially around this platform question, I was having this interesting conversation with a group of sex workers about like, look, like it requires also a certain kind of technical knowledge, right? In terms of trying to build out these platforms. And again, for a lot of sex workers, if you're just trying, especially during the pandemic, right? Like you're just out here trying to like work and survive, right? And like, so who has the time and again, the capacity to build these, these platforms? Instead, the platforms need to change, right? Um, so I was thinking, Laura, you brought up, you know, when you were making a comment before about uh, kind of algorithms and stuff, but there's a really um, wonderful book by um, Sophia Noble called Algorithms of Oppression. If nobody has read this book, like, because again, I think it's just really important that I think sometimes there's a tendency to see the internet as this kind of race neutral, gender neutral, you know, space. Um, and clearly it's not. <laughs> and so I think there needs to be more 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 pressure on the platforms themselves to change and maybe that goes back to part of helen's question before too right that like in terms of political organizing maybe that's part of the the, the that that movement right is to place pressure on these platforms to change and shift in ways that maybe don't actually have anything to do with their bottom line but in ways that would make them you know more inclusive less exploitative but you know i don't i don't i i'm not at all hopeful that you know a platform owner who's making millions and millions of dollars is necessarily going to want to change some of those algorithms in the interests of justice. Um, so yeah, and again, I think it's unfair in many ways to suggest that the burden to change, whether it's these racist platforms or sexist, but whatever, falls on sex workers, right? Um, uh, absolutely. Um, Katie, yeah, the work that Hacking and Hustling has been doing, continues to do, um, again, community-based sex worker red research, um, that is an excellent place. And they, during COVID, for folks in the audience, um, my sense is, Katie, you, you posted it, so you know, but folks in the audience, if you're interested in this, Hacking and Hustling during COVID, they did a number of phenomenal panels. There's one in particular um, I can't remember, but the, the panel is all disabled sex workers talking about kind of labor and rights that I think would be kind of relevant to some of the questions that came up here. But yeah, they did a number of really phenomenal um, panels, uh, virtual panels that I think folks might want to check out. Fab, thank you so much. Um, and lots of good places for us to look next as well I think being posted in the chat that's great um I think we could go out all evening but we're gonna have to stop I'm sorry <laughs> um, I said it's morning so I just got started you, you people <laughs> yeah you can carry on all afternoon we're off to have our tea um thank you thank you so much I mean the the chat and how enthusiastic people are just shows how, how wonderful it was it was really brilliant and thank you so much um for coming and giving the talk it was great thank you um
so yeah thank you everybody for coming um and if you want to come to the next one um the links are in the chat uh, the next the next event in the series um thank you so much angela absolutely thank, thank you everyone you. bye, bye.